getting blinded by the light there. Okay. as well thank you well good afternoon I think we can get a kind of get get started I think everybody can hear me okay I do apologize I am without the mask I usually wear it but since I'm speaking uh, that's my excuse so hope you guys are okay with that so my name is Jacob Choi I am the assistant regional director at the Texas regional office US patent and trademark office so how many of you know what does the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office do? Just raise your hand. Okay, just three of you. Um, when I say patents and trademarks, copyrights and trade secret, does that ring a bell? Have you heard that before? Okay. So uh, I'm here with Jeff Burke. Uh, he's a, a supervisory patent examiner at managing number of patent examiners that is the art unit. So. Uh, we are thrilled the fact that we are here today with you, and this can be what I consider as somewhat of a boring topic, but I'll try to make things entertaining. So uh, along the way, please feel free to raise your hand and ask questions, okay? All right. All right, so your robotic competition, I, we just got a tour of it, it's fantastic. So, um, so good luck with everybody. You know, it's a competition, so. Um, so we're going to talk in summary. Um, first, I'm going to try to introduce the topic of intellectual property and the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office. And Jeff is going to come back and talk a little bit about um, four different types of intellectual property. Okay? So that's, a, that's the sort of a, a plan, and that we're going to do all of that within the next 50 minutes or so. So we're going to kind of rush through, but be patient with us. We'll try to get those information out to you guys. If you haven't already, in the front, uh, they did allow us to set up some booth setup where you guys can actually pick up some of the information packets, inventors' cards that you guys can maybe trade. Uh, if you haven't already, please do so. We have some bookmarks and stickers and the like. All right, next slide. So I guess that this is a disclaimer. By no means, anything that you're seeing on the slide presentation mean, doesn't mean that U.S. Patent and Trademark Office is actually promoting them, okay? By the way, U.S. Patent and Trademark Office falls underneath the Department of Commerce. If you are ever into the government sector, that's what we are, okay? So let's talk a little bit about intellectual property. The images that you see, and I, I'm trying to relate a lot of things that in terms of the why you guys are here today in terms of robotics, things that you guys are creating. You want to really think about is this something that I have created that is new and non-obvious, thus, can I protect it under the forms of patents, trademark, or copyright trade secrets, okay? So in terms of things that you guys are here for, I want you to start thinking about, is it an intellectual property? How can I protect it, right? So the property, the word property works the same way. When you have a certain things like patents, and trademarks, and copyrights, and whatnot, it's a property that you can actually, well, it's your own, as like yours, your house and your car and the like, that's something that you could use for yourself or you could lease it to other people, right? Or you could sell it. So it works just like the property. Okay, we're gonna get into the uh, different types of intellectual pr property later. Okay, next slide. Um, so when I was, uh, when I came to the state, um, one of the things that I've done with my parents to really learn English, this was back in seventh grade, uh, was, was to go to actually a place called Blockbuster. How many of you know what a Blockbuster is? Most of you, great. So the reason I love going there is because over the weekends, there isn't much to do, and the way you can actually learn English to, is to actually watch a lot of movies. I did watch also a lot of soap operas, uh, Days of Our Lives, I don't know if you guys remember those, to learn English, okay? So on the weekends, I would go to Blockbuster with my dad and my brother, and they would pick out the favorite movie. The way you can tell is actually by knowing, seeing these empty boxes, right? If you see a bunch of them, that means it's been a popular movie. 
So you pick one of those out. No brainer, right? So back then, I actually had uh, came up with some uh, really nice idea. Um, so after getting the movie, uh, DVD back then, I was standing in front of a vending machine. A vending machine that spits out sodas and Coca-Cola, Dr. Peppers and the like. So right at that moment, what do you think what I was thinking about? I'm holding the DVD in my one hand and I'm sitting in front of the vending machine. Guy at the yellow shirt. I couldn't hear you. Yeah. Um, I'm wondering if that gave you or the shirt gave you some of the vending machine that would spit out the movie. Fantastic. What about the girl in the back? I was going to say, this is some great TV news right now. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, that's, too, that's true, too. So I was thinking about the red box that you guys probably have used before, but right now everything is on streaming, right? So. If you think about the, my childhood and things that you guys think about every day, if you guys are sort of the person that likes to solve problems, per se, right? What do I mean by that? Okay, you interact with things every day, don't you? And sometimes you wonder, why does it work that way? Why can't it be better? Why can't it work the other way? Isn't that why you guys are doing the robotics, right? Figuring out the better way of doing things. It's a function that you need to perform, maybe picking up the ball and dropping some plates, right? Using mechanism and coding and the like, you're trying to figure out the better way of doing things, right? So that's when the inventions or the idea comes about, right? And you guys are actually putting into action by making stuff. But people like me back then, I'm not the CEO of Redbox, right? But general public, what they tend to do is they stop. They think about these great ideas, and they stop. They don't sketch it out, they don't write it down, they don't talk to other people about your idea and your inventions, they stop. So that's the things that I, frustrates me the most, and I want you to, anything that is take away from this presentation is for you to take the next step. What I mean by that is, if you have a great idea, at least jot it down. Talk to your parents, talk to your peers. Is this a good way of solving problems? Do you have any thoughts? How can we make it better, right? So that's innovation, okay? And that's where the patent system, trademark system, copyright system comes into play. If you have invented something, you can protect it. It's a property on the previous slide, okay? You can make your own, it's an asset for you, and you can own it, you can sell it, you can lease it, okay? Think about all those things. So don't make the mistakes that I have made sitting there with a great idea, not doing anything about it, okay? Next slide. Okay, what is the hashtag real McCoy? Who's, uh, do you guys know who this person is? Okay, I bet you're gonna have all the answers to my questions, go ahead. Locomotives, exactly. So he was actually a mechanical engineer. Next slide. By the way, I do have this inventor's card in, out in the front. If you want to go and pick it up, please do so. And the back actually tells you what he actually has invented. Okay? So he was a mechanical engineer, and what he noticed is that back then, all the locomotives, moving parts and engines, steam engines and the, and the like, did not use any oil to cool them down. So back then, what happened was, train will move a certain number of hours and it would need to stop because it would overheat. McCoy came up with this idea of using the fluid, right, to cool and lubricate the system, the, the steam engine, okay? So, again, if you think about that, that story or any other great stories that we know of, people always start with curiosity, way of thinking and approaching in a way that's solving problems and being able to take the next step. They don't stop, they take the next step, okay? Next slide. All right, here's a question for you, for you guys to think about. Hypothetical. I want uh, my car to be able to drive on snow. What can we invent? So just have a mental image of 
what this vehicle may look like. Okay? You guys ready? Next slide. So this is a very old, <laughs> old pattern. Okay? So a guy named J.W. Stovey, I think I'm reading it correctly. This, he was wondering the same thing. Right? So he came up with this idea, an invention, sketched it out, wrote it down as part of his disclosure, and this is how it is. If you look at it now, many, many years after, you look at the drawing itself, everything kind of makes sense because it's kind of known. All the parts that you see is essentially part of bicycle, isn't it? Other than the spiky wheels, right? Part of maybe snowboard or ski, right? So he did, took, he did take the next step of filing a patent application, although you may think there is no such a thing like that exists today, right? But that was at that time, was probably one of the greatest inventions. Okay? All right, next slide. Would you fly in this? You don't have to think about this. You guys know this is who? Who invented this idea? Okay, but we have to ask ourselves, would you get on things like this, a flying machine, and then maybe run down the hill and then try to fly? Is that safe? Right? So think about the risk, actually physical risk that they took to make this invention possible. And also think about all the flying machines that came after this invention. Maybe you actually flew from other parts of the country or maybe a different state. What, what could, ha I mean, can you imagine, hey, Jeff, can we get on a, this airplane and then we'll fly to Houston from Dallas, right? That's what in innovation does. You will benefit from it, you create it, you let other people know about that. In the meantime, you may have a certain amount of protection in, in terms of the years, right? But years later, people come up with better ideas and better inventions. They further improve upon those ideas. That's how the US innovation ecosphere happens. And the patent system, trademark system, although you may not be too familiar with it, that excites that engine. Okay? So think about all the innovations that came after this, and think about all the great ideas that you might have right now you may have thought of, if you don't do anything with that and let other people know, then there you are essentially suppressing, yes, something can go wrong. <laughs> no, it's okay. Something can go wrong, right? So we need to continue to innovate and protect those intellectual properties, disclose it to the other people so they know they can further improve, okay? That's what I'm talking about. I'm passionate about this topic is that ecosphere keeps on turning, keeps on moving, okay? Because I don't want to fly this from Dallas to Houston. I don't think so, okay? Next slide. Okay, space exploration to infinity and beyond. Next slide. So this is another um, inventor cards that we have, well, along with many other that we have. If you don't, didn't get one yet, please pick one up. So I believe if you look to the back, she is uh, with NASA. She's the first Hispanic American woman in space, landed in space. But she was curious about capturing images when she gets there. So she, her invention was focused on how do I take this image? And then especially in the dark areas. You know, what happens when you grab your photo, take a picture of a dark room? You get all this fuzzy, fuzzy. You, with your eyes, you can see it, right? But with the camera, it does not see it. So she actually came up with a system that actually uh, make the picture quality better in the dark photos, okay? Okay, again, another person, right? She may be working for NASA or astronaut, but thought of, here's a problem, how can I solve it? What do I do with that? Okay, that's the common theme. Next slide. I do wanna give you enough time to Jeff to cover his stuff, so let me, cover back to what is U.S. Patent and Trademark Office, okay? So like I said earlier, we are part of the Department of Commerce. Uh, our employees, so we can actually separate, separate them into four different buckets. 
So we have an examiners, patent examiners that actually review those patent applications that you may file in the near future. Also, we do have number of trademark examining attorneys that looks at your logos and brandings of your companies and uh, startups and whatnot, and they register those marks so that people are not confused about walking into Starbucks, maybe you'll find Nike shoes. So they, that's what it does, by the way, in terms of trademarks. It, it re removes all the confusion, right, in the public eyes or commerce. So we also have uh, uh, PTAB judges or trademark, uh, uh, TTAB, so trademark trial and appeal board uh, judges. If you look to the right, those are the numbers in terms of the filing. So you may not realize this, but every year, there are over like 600,000 patent applications being filed every year, and then some. And then from that, you'll see that about half will actually get issued. Okay, then from that point on, those patents actually get 20 years of protection. It's your asset, okay? You would exclude others from uh, making or selling these, those inventions, okay? So trademark on the other side, there are about 700 applications being filed. At the bottom, there are about 300,000. Next slide. Um, if you guys are interested in some of the laws, so after American Invents Act that was passed back in 2011, it allowed, Congress allowed the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office to open up four regional offices, okay? So what you are seeing there is we have our first regional office open in Detroit, followed by Denver, Colorado, and Silicon Valley office, and I'm from Texas regional office, okay? The color coding that you're seeing there is where we respect to the outreach. I come to places like this, try to inform you guys about a little bit about intellectual property. Hopefully you leave this room thinking about what did Jacob say, okay? He said something about patents and trademarks, okay? So hopefully later on, when you go back, maybe visit our website, you'll, you'll be able to kind of connect the dots, right? I don't, I'm not asking for you guys to obtain all the information, but at least understand what is patent, what is trademark, and the like, okay? Next slide. Uh, that's a shot of our headquarters uh, located in Alexandria, Virginia. Um, so, bottom line, our agency is uh, responsible for issuing uh, patents for uh, and uh, tra uh, registering trademarks, okay? And another objective that we have is actually come out to places like this, inform public about intellectual property. Next slide. Okay, how am I doing with my time? So I have some tips for you. There's gonna be three different steps, I believe. So maybe kind of bear with me and then walk through those steps, okay? Okay, tip number one, you gotta do your homework. Yeah, people love homework, don't you? Okay, first, uh, you have to know your invention. What was new? That problem solving, those steps that you have taken, maybe things that you have sketched, the idea that you had in your head, is it truly an invention? So ask this question. What that means, what is that question asking is, has it been done before? If you're sitting in this very chair and you thought of another chair that has four legs and a cushion, is that new? It's not. It's a chair. You're sitting in it. It has been already invented. Okay, so believe it or not, there was a patent application filed just for this chair that you're sitting in right now. Okay? How is it new? So you have to think about, so what was it different? Did you put a new caster on this chair that now you can kind of move one place to another? That's a new idea, right? So if you came up with that, possibly that's a new idea, right? But guess what? People already invented that. So I'm disclosing things that is already been invented. You probably sat on the very chair that maybe at home but has casters, okay? So another question that you have to ask is, that, does it make things better? Does it improve over the existing Prior prior means whatever existed before that time that you came up with that idea, okay? I want to pause here for a second to see if there are any questions. I don't want people to fall asleep. Yes? Absolutely. Okay. So you have to think about, um, approach this sort of environment or this conversation in a way that 
whatever you're thinking about. I mean, it may be this very same chair, uh, you, or you may be thinking, how can I make this chair better, right? Does it have a headrest, right? Does it have a cushion? Maybe it's an interesting fabric that actually lasts longer than this fabric right now. So there's many different aspects or improvements that you can make. Yes? Software codes? Yeah. Yes. That's a very good question. So when it comes to intellectual property, there's a two things you can do with respect to software code. It could be copyrighted. It can be patented, but there's a law that you have to follow in a way. So it has to be attached to a tangible media in order to, to become even considered as a patent application. Does that make sense? Yeah. So if it's if it's computer, let's say, with the code that performs certain function to a, a sort of a hardware, let's say, that in itself can be maybe patented. If you're just speaking about the software code itself, it can be copyrighted. It may not be a patent because it, all it does is just coding, right? So under the rule, certain rules as a, a what we call 35 USC 101, you, I'm gonna probably like what the, what's that? So. That is not allowed, just code itself. Okay? So it depends. Absolutely. Yeah. So you're talking about the coding and, and then the, the mechanism or the robot doing certain function, right? If it's widely used, then you have to ask these questions back to this sort of the drawing board. Yeah, yeah, the very generic model has uh, 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 only one key, but okay. uh, uh, something like Clifford, you know, it has uh, three keys uh, somewhere in there. So I'm guessing it's something that has a patent. Okay. Um, so in that very example, so answer is going to be depends. Depends on your application. We, we're not going to have a chance to talk about the bits and bits of, a, I guess, a claim limitation. So we'll get to part, some, uh, part of it. So we'll, we'll, we'll kind of revisit that topic. But think about this. If you're thinking about, okay, your robot actually not only has a single speed, but it may have another speed, maybe another gear to go faster, right? Okay. What other vehicles that you can think of actually might have that? Is that obvious? It depends. Depends on what the mechanism is allowing you to go to the first gear to the second gear. How is that working? How is it mechanically connected from your robot compared to the vehicle gear system, right? So these are kind of questions that you have to ask yourself. Is it, did I invent something new or is it, uh, something that has already existed and you saw it at some point and then you're just applying that same logic or the concept to your robotics. Okay? Okay, I'll take one more question. Yes. In fact, my next slide covers that. So you kind of predicted the future. So if you are curious about, hey, Jacob told me about patents, you know, has it been done before? So what you want to do is we actually release this new uh, patent search system that you can do at home. So you can go to USPTO.gov backslash patents. And then this, by the way, is the very same tool that some of our patent examiners are using for searching for their priors when they're working on their cases. Okay, so here, what you can do is do some text search in terms of, let's say, robotics. And then you can add some motors or gears and things like that in nature. You can do keyword search, maybe similar to Google search, right? And then it will generate a list of patent applications or patent publications that has the same words that are, that are in the application. Does that make sense? So you want to kind of look through those documents to see, hey, is it the same? If it's not, then you may go to the next steps. Okay? Okay. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah. So that's a great question. There's uh, two things I could uh, tell you, um, and, and let me know if I'm answering your question, okay? So number one, we actually have to ask ourselves, when you file for patent application, you have to make sure that your invention is in fact something new, a brand new, let's say light bulb, right, as an example, uh, or McCoy back to the, you know, using oil system to you know, cool down the steam engine, right? That's a new idea. Another one that our examiners are actually expert in kind of testing the obviousness. So if I put, let me just give you a hypothetical, you got this chair, it's made out of chrome, right? It looks shiny and nice. But instead you want to paint it in color pink. Do you think that that's obvious? Can anybody here come here and then, you know, come up with the maybe similar ideas? Right, so that's the test, I'm simplifying the whole step but it's sort of, that will be obvious. So if you think your invention is obvious, I'm just gonna paint this color chair uh, pink, then in fact, you may not want to file for that patent application. Yeah, in order to, for all, our examiners to grant you a patent, application to a patent, it has to be brand new idea and or it has to be non-obvious, okay? So I like to think our examiners as a fact finders. So they cannot just bluntly say that, hey, that would have been obvious, and then they will write their opinion. It's rather they would actually go to the search system that we just talked about, find those prior arts that talks about painting the chair in different colors, right? And somebody disclosed it maybe 10, 20 years ago, and they have to use what's called nexus. They have to connect the dots between those that, that teaching and versus the new, t new items, maybe painting a color, and be able to kind of connect the dots. Does that make sense? That's why I call them a fact finder. They can't just, out of nowhere, hey, that's obvious. Okay? Okay, great question. All right. So if you are interested in trademark search, you know, like your brand and your company names and whatnot, you can actually, we have a system called the test. It's called the Trademark Electronic Search System. You can go there, like let's say, you want to, let's say, Starbucks, as an example. If you go there now and then search for a word Starbucks, you would actually get Starbucks logo. So you can't get trademark on that. Does that make sense? Okay. Next slide. You can also use Google Patents. So go to Google Patents and then do the same text search or the word search that you might want to do. It may pull uh, some of the relevant documents that's related to the word that you're choosing for that search. Okay. Yes. Trademarked. That's a great question. Usually the trademark search here that uh, you're gonna do here is with the word search. So what the Starbucks typically they do is they not only they protect the logo, but the, they actually protect the word itself, the word Starbucks, okay? Does that answer your question or kind of getting close? So the search engine really cannot do image search. Like, that, that's maybe the answer that you are looking for. Okay, but usually like companies like Xerox, Apple, right? Those are, if you go those and if you go to the system now and then search for those words, you will definitely get those, not only the word itself, but the logo and the branding and sub-brandings of those goods and services that may exist out in the commerce. Yes. Yep. So how would, uh, how would the text be to be considered uh, supplement? Like okay. The same logo with different colors would be supplement. Like the way we would search in, uh, in sort of a natural search engine. So like it's still uh, uh, sort of a white background, but now it's just been tweaked or different. Okay. Kind of, uh, 
I think that's a great question. So here's where I, what I would say to that. The reason why people file for trademark is so that in the commerce, people are not confused about what they're getting when you go to the Starbucks. So meaning that, uh, back to my old childhood, I went to this store called Bonton, right? And there was a brand that I saw, it's called Alfani. It's kind of mimicking Almani, right? So I was like, what's this? Kind of sound like Almani, but it's, it says Alfani, right? So that would, in my mind, create a sort of a confusion. I'm already looking at the brand, so is it this or that, right? So what the trademark does is actually the voice removes that confusion in the commerce. So we don't want you guys to be com confused whenever you walk into, let's say, Apple store, and all of a sudden, you see like Mac product, I'm sorry, Microsoft products, right? That's the, what the trademark does, so that you guys are in a commerce, when you're shopping for different things, looking for different things, confused about uh, what you're really getting. Does that answer your question? Yes. Yeah. Uh, do you have like How, I'm sorry? Absolutely, that's a big problem, right? So um, maybe we can talk offline <laughs> about that topic. Why do we have a fake stuff? That's a great question. And you have to ask yourself, what would originate this fake stuff? It's because it's popular, and people want to actually make money, cheat the system, right? And then create imitations, and then imports to maybe this country, and sell it to people and they're confused. There's an enforcement side of the intellectual property, which isn't today's topic, but we more than happy to sit down with you and then give you sort of an overview as to what that is, okay? And I, it is a problem. Why do we have fake stuff? But we do, unfortunately. Even Amazon, when you go sometimes and purchase some goods, you were thinking that you're getting the original part for your engine oil, maybe your car engine filter, but you're not getting the original part, right? I understand that problem. It should not be, yeah. So if I'm the company that creates um, engine filter, then I see a, a false advertisement that mimics my product and as well as um, the good that it's selling that is not mine, but it's they're copying my idea, copying my trademark, then I would need to, if you have the trademark, you can actually enforce your trademark rights. Go after those people that are cheating. Okay, that's the, actually the benefit of filing for patent applications and getting obtaining a patent as well as trademarks. Okay. All right, next slide. Sections. Okay. So I'm not. I don't have too much time. I do want to give Jeff some time to go over patents, trademark, copyright, and trade secrets. So just go to the next slide, Jeff. And here is a picture of the patent document. Just the front page of it. This is, what is it? Nintendo. You guys love game, and this is kind of old. But what you see on the top is the whoever invented. On the right-hand side, you, what you see is when it was invented, what is the patent number, and who is assigned to it, as well as some of the prior art documents that was noted before this became a patent, as well as some of the summary of the invention itself. This is just the cover page. Also, at the bottom, what you're seeing is an image or diagram that uh, describes the invention itself. Uh, this is kind of what you're seeing in terms of patent document. Just the first page, okay? Uh, next slide. These are some of the details of the drawing, diagram of the system itself. Next slide. So if you look into the body of the patent document, again, more boring stuff, but not only it, it needs to say, hey, at that time that I, was in, I invented this, uh, my, the, the things that I knew at that time was X, Y, Z, and this, uh, my discovery actually solves what kind of problems, as well as um, now then I need to get into the description of your invention. Think of it as like the manual that you would get anytime you buy a pur purchase a product, right? It kind of walks you through how to you know, set it up and use it, right? So that's the description, the part that, I'm, that this is ta talking about. I'll get to your question. Let me finish my slides. Next slide. Next slide. So we didn't talk too much about the claims. This is the word that actually describes your invention, provides a legal boundaries of tears my invention. So it actually defines a four corner, let's say for this, ex this very room. But it, needs, it uses word, right, 
to describe your patent boundaries. And this is really the most important part of patent document. Okay, next slide. I won't get into the examination process. We won't have time. Uh, so I will just end with this and before I turn it over to Jeff. Um, you, you guys don't need to really obtain all of this information. I've been with USB2 for about 20 years. I'm still learning, right? So the takeaway is um, after Jeff finished his talk, just understand that there are four different types of intellectual property, right? If you have more questions and it needs to be answered, contact us, okay? We are the resource. We wanna provide the information so that you can better utilize the system, okay? Can I get to your question and I'll turn it over to Jeff. Sure. So how does it work? Like Nintendo is a Japanese company. Yep. So I imagine it's filed in Japan. Yep. And in the US. Yep. And how does it like do you have like a stipulation type agreement? Or like if they file in Japan, do yeah. you think they should take that same exact thing and just apply to all these other countries that they're selling stuff in? Great and question. If you don't hit a country, then what happens? Sure. That's a really great question. So Intellectual property is territorial. What I mean by that is if you want to get a, a IP protection in US, then you would go to the US Patent and Trademark Office and file your application. If you want your protection in Europe or Germany or other parts of Asia, then you would go to their patent office and file a separate application. For in this very example, Nintendo, what they ha may have done is they were originated from Japan, so they may have patent filing in that country they expand it to other parts of the country where they think that they're gonna sell their products and they wanna obtain the patent protection in those countries, and that's the roadmap that they have chosen for their innovative ideas. So Does that? if someone, so Nintendo didn't, let's say, file here in the US, they filed in Japan, and someone was selling a knockoff here in the US. <laughs> you guys are, idea. okay. But, but they don't do it in Japan, they really just don't have any legal recourse there, right? If you don't have a patent, let's say, in this country, you can't enforce your invention in a way, country. in that country. Yeah. But if you have other parts of the country, then yes, you may, oh. right? You can, you can also go after for the knockoffs that you're talking about if you actually, in fact, have IP protection in that country, okay? I'm, I apologize, I need to turn it over to Jeff, and then I think it's better that we talk offline, okay? Thanks, Jeff. Thanks, Jacob. All right, this is exciting for me. As Jacob said, I'm a supervisor, uh, supervising patent examiner. Um, the technologies that my examiner examines are vehicle controls and robotics. Uh, so being here is pretty exciting for me. Um, what are the different types of intellectual property? Well, there's four types. There's patents, trademarks, trade secrets, and copyrights. And we handle the first two. We handle patents and trademarks. Copyrights are handled by the Department or the uh, Library of Congress, and trade secrets are handled by nobody because they're important to keep secret. Uh, next slide for me, Jacob. So what is a patent? Uh, getting at it, it's the exclusive right to an invention. Specifically, it's the exclusive right of the United States to make, use, and sell the invention. Uh, so in your example, if they didn't apply for an application or a patent in, in the United States, then you know there could be any number of knockoffs sold and made and used there. Um, we, like I said, we get to the owner may exclude others from making, using, or selling. Um, the patent owner is responsible for enforcement. We don't enforce patents um, unless it's our patent, a government patent. They, the government may enforce its own patents, but typically um, the owner is responsible for enforcement. And then down here, our bottom note is courts can award injunctions and or monetary damages, which can be substantial in cases of patent infringement. Next slide for me, Jacob. Utility patents. So we've got actually three types of patents. We've got utility, uh, we've got plants, and we've got designs. Our utility patents protect the functionality of things. Um, they protect a process, a machine, article of manufacture, composition of matter. Like Jacob said, you don't see specifically a so like software code on there, but software code kind of falls under process when it's embodied on that machine, the computer readable medium. Um, and so that's how we kind of protect the functionality of software code in patents. Next slide. We have our design patents. This is a great one. This is glass bottle. I think this is Coca-Cola. Um, it's a you know, our design patents protect essentially the, the, the aesthetic, what we call aesthetic designs of things. 
Um, there's a little bit of overlap between a design patent and, you know, kind of the trademark area. They're kind of both protecting designs, although the design patent is more structurally associated with the aesthetic design. Uh, next slide for me, Jacob. Oh, here's a good one. Um, these were around when I was a kid. Uh, this is the Reebok pump, and you probably none of you probably know what that is. Um, but go to the next slide for me, Jacob, and you get a colored version of it. That was the first um, shoe, athletic shoe, that had like integrated extra structural support. You pumped on the basketball and it inflated the think the area around your ankle, so theoretically you didn't um, or you you had better support. You wouldn't twist your ankles and stuff like that. Um, those came around in about 1992, and they were quickly gone off the market. Um, next slide. So here's our, here's our patent. Uh, that's our design patent for our, I think it's our design patent, yeah, for our um, Reebok pump. And you can see it there, like Jacob said, that's the front page. It names the inventors. It tells you the shoe upper. It tells you the description. And the interesting thing about the claim for the design patent, it's typically that one statement there. And ornamental design typically says something as shown in these drawings or as approximately shown in these drawings or as described above. And that's how we get our design patents. Next slide for me, Jacob. So here's our plant patents, and that's our third and last type. Um, you know, that's an avocado. We have, there's several famous, I think, uh, as there's an azalea patent, there's some other patents for some famous flowers, but in our plant patents, plant patents, typically what you get is some type of living organism um, that, that becomes uh, protected under plant patents. Next slide for me. Oh, that's our, that's our azalea, or maybe our, our magnolia. I can't remember what that one is. A poinsettia, that's what that is. So that's our poinsettia, and you can see here the important aspects of this are the color drawing to distinguish the flower and its flowering bloom, um, and that that is actually, you know, I think that patent's expired for some period of time now, but that was our poinsettia patent. Next slide for me, Jacob. Okay, what can you do if someone uses your patent invention without authorization? Uh, you've got a number of options. You can advise them of, of your patent rights. Essentially send a cease and desist letter and say, you're infringing on my patent. Here's my patent number. Here's what you're doing. You're infringing. Um, from there, it pretty much uh, depends on your, you know, their response as to what you do. Um, if they say, okay, I think we're infringing, can we license this from you? You can sell them a license, and you can say you can make and use this under our licensing agreement, right? Or if they say we're not infringing your patent or we don't think you're infringing your patent or in a much less likely scenario, we're infringing it and there's nothing you can do about it, you can sue in federal court. Um, question. It, it protects the aesthetic design elements. So it protects, typically in those design patent cases, you'll see like that claim that says, a design is substantially described herein, and there's 25 figures. So each one of those figures would be protect, protected, right? But any functionality associated with that thing, like the pump, um, the actual pumping mechanism was a separate, separate patent. That, that, so that, that was separate and apart. That was a utility patent separate and apart from the actual design of the pump. Question. Yes, there absolutely. Our our office is segmented into several technology centers. The technology center I work in, like I said, is real uh, vehicle controls and robotics. There's a biological. There's a pharmacological. There's physical sciences. There's data processing. If it's you know if it's a new and unknown chemical and you you've discovered it, you can absolutely apply for a patent for it. Okay. It's kind of outside the scope of the discussion, but there are some there are some limitations on patent protection. Um, I don't know that that would fall within those limitations, but it, it could, you know. So, Can the next slide for me, Jacob. So our second area is trademarks. Like I said, like Jacob said, we're the Patent and Trademark Office. The second area is trademarks. Um, what is a trademark? It's any name, symbol, or device. Um, used to identify the source of products and services and to distinguish them from other goods. 
You can see some pretty famous ones there. My favorite is the Jumpman, Michael Jordan, down in the bottom left corner, but also Apple at the top right, McDonald's Golden Arches, the AAA, um, Macy's, and I, is that Starbucks at the top left, Under Armour? Girl Scouts. Girl Scouts, there you go, you're right. Girl Scouts and then Dodge down at the bottom. Uh, next slide for me. So we have words or designs. Pepsi, you know, the, the circle with the, with the white uh, center through it, that's been a well-known um, trademark for a while. Your Legos, um, Dr. Pepper, Pizza Hut, I, we got one from First here with their design, that's a cool one. Uh, and then Domino's. Uh, so those are some uh, designs or words that function as trademarks. Next slide for me, Jacob. Other things, shapes of products. The peep is trademarked. The peep shape is trademarked. The teardrop or the kiss of the Hershey Kiss is trademarked. The, obviously, the mouse ears are trademarked. The smiling goldfish from Pepperidge Farms is trademarked. And um, the color brown, UPS, that's trade dress. It's protected. It's pr that, that specific uh, design is a trade dress that's protected by UPS. Next slide for me. Colors. Here we go. Can anybody tell me who the bottom left is? Just scream it out. John Deere. Yeah. Does anybody know who, who's, who there, who's there in the center? Yep. Owens Corning Insulation. Um, top left, for those of you that are younger or can't really read or like I, is that's Tiffany and Company. Their, their Tiffany boxes, their green boxes are protected. Um, and like I said, down at the bottom right, we've got UPS. And from some of us older people up there, the Etch-A-Sketch, that's a well-known <laughs> trademark. So, all right, next slide for me. Sounds. Um, Homer Simpson's dough is trademarked. The Aflac duck sound is a trademark sound. Um, the Pillsbury Doughboy laugh is a trademark sound. Uh, the Metro Goldwyn Meyer lion roaring is a famous trademark sound. One thing that's not on here because they lost um, their ability to register it because the office didn't think it was a source of, uh, source of significance was Harley Davidson tried to patent or trademark, I'm sorry, the sound of their exhaust, claiming that it w made the sound potato, 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 and it was a unique sound and they were unable to register it. So, next slide for me. Why are trademarks important? It's that bottom line right there. They allow customers to distinguish between different products and services. Not only that, they allow customers to distinguish the significance of those services. So if you see the golden arches, you should know that a Big Mac's going to taste the same here that it tastes overseas. If you see a John Deere tractor, you should, know, you should think that it's gonna be as hardy here as it is anywhere else. Uh, next slide for me, Jacob. True or false, only trademarks registered when the U.S. may be used, may use the registration R symbol. True. So R right there indicates a, yeah, I know. It, it was a slide that had animation. We, we took it down. Um, that R stands for federally registered. You'll see TM sometimes. TM is common law trademark registration. There's no federal protection for that until you get a federal trademark. Okay. Next slide for me, Jacob. Okay, copyrights. This is an important one too, but we don't, we don't cover this one. This one goes to the Library of Congress. Um, things that are protected by copyrights, songs, movies, books, sculpture, sc or sculptures, essentially any what we call creative artistic work that can be fixed in a tangible medium at its time, right? Source code, copyrightable. Uh, song lyrics, copyrightable. Song tunes, copyrightable. There's some overlap there in jingles and songs, copyrightable and potentially trademarkable. So, next slide for me. And then our last one is trade secrets. So does anybody here know what a trade secret is? In the yellow, we're gonna go with you since you've been right on everyone since so far. That's a pretty accurate description. A trade secret is something that is valuable, some business practice or otherwise that's valuable because of the fact that it is secret, right? So there is no mechanism for registering or notifying anybody of what a trade secret is because that would defeat the purpose of having a trade secret and keeping it secret. Our two best examples here are Coca-Cola, um, which also has a little trademark registration there. Um, their formula is a closely held trade secret and uh, Colonel's 11, seven herbs and spices, 11, I 
can't remember the number. That's a closely held trade secret. Um, for a long time, the PageRank algorithm was a closely held trade secret for Google, how they m changed the weights. They have sin that's since been disclosed, I think, or they've since changed it up. So, um, next slide for me, Jacob. Go ahead. Algorithms can be trade secrets, absolutely. You can have an algorithm running in the background of a computer program um, that you maintain as a trade secret. As long as you take reasonable steps to keep it a secret, um, and as long as you know, nobody finds it out. Now, a defense to, or a way of getting at a trade secret is reverse engineering. And it's perfectly legal to reverse engineer a trade secret. So if you gave, if you gave somebody your object code that was running this trade secreted algorithm and they reverse engineered it and figured it out, you no longer have a trade secret because they reverse engineered it. So. Um, some of our, our famous patents that, ca that came out of this event, uh, the flying monkeys from Ames, Iowa, uh, they got to meet President Obama and their invention was on the next slide. Um, they helped a little girl who had never been able to color before because she was born with some uh, genetic deformities so they, they built this device right here to allow kids with uh, hand issues to be able to color. And so they filed for this patent, and they got a patent issued here in uh, 2014 on this coloring device, this adaptive coloring device. Uh, next slide. Uh, moderately confused out of Dublin, they came up with a way to determine whether food was safe in storage. And the next slide will show us. It's a sticker, and it had some chemicals on it. And when the food became rotten, the label would render would read unsafe. Great patent. Uh, and then our, I think our next one is our last one, uh, the Lego Lions out of Northern Virginia. So they had a rain jacket um, that detected, they call it the floody, which I think is a great name, um, that detected amounts of water in excess of what would be normal, and it would inflate to prevent drowning. So if a kid fell in the pool, they would, uh, they, they would inflate, and be, it would become a personal flotation device. Um, and then our next slide, oh, our last one is the blockheads. Uh, yeah, they have eco glue. They came up with, they, they realized the problem that all this glue in the world is toxic, uh, and they came up with a formula, chemical formula, for uh, glue that was non toxic, and they got a patent for it. Next slide for me, Jacob. And that's their patent for their eco glue. Uh, and then next slide. Um, are you the next first team with a patent we can showcase? We cer certainly hope so. Um, Lots of bright, uh, smart faces out there. And if you have any questions or comments, always follow up with us. The department, our, our education department is right there, education at uspto.gov. And if you have, I think we're out of time, so we don't have time for any more questions. And that's, so that's our last slide. We appreciate it.